So first off, I want to say that the entire premise of seeker sensitive or creating an environment for worship for people who are ultimately unable to worship God is an unbiblical thing. The, even the term seeker sensitive is not a biblical term. Romans chapter 3 verse 11 reads, no one understands, no one seeks after God. And you may say, Tim, well that's crazy. Of course there are people that seek after God. Are you using that verse out of context? And no, I'm not. This is the Apostle Paul being very clear and actually re-quoting from the Old Testament that no one seeks after God. Well then what about the people that seem like they are seeking? Well, R.C. Sproul actually offered a very good insight to this when he was asked about the seeker-sensitive movement. And to paraphrase him, he said that people are innately seeking after the benefits of God. There's that God-sized hole that's missing inside their life. They understand that. Romans chapter 1 talks about this. And they're ultimately seeking after the benefits of God rather than the entire belief in God himself. We actually see this beautifully displayed in scripture throughout the ministry of Jesus. If you go over to Luke chapter 18, we see the story of the rich young ruler. And in that story, this rich young ruler knew something was missing inside of his life, and he knew that he was not saved, that he did not have eternal life. So he runs up to Jesus, he shows him respect, he calls him good teacher, even kneels before him when you're reading in Mark's account, and asks what must he do to inherit eternal life. Jesus goes through a big, deep explanation, and he actually almost gives him a harder version of the gospel than most people would actually deliver. John MacArthur talks about Jesus would have flunked modern-day evangelism 101. Here you have a person who is asking, what must I do to be saved? And instead of preaching the gospel, instead of going hard, Jesus goes ahead and opens up with the, why do you call me good? And you know the commandments. And he starts listing five of them off. After this, he tells the person that he still lacks one thing and he cuts to the heart of the matter. Jesus tells him to sell everything, give the money to the poor, and follow him. Jesus, like I said, cutting to the heart of the matter, knew that this person wanted to seek the benefits of being saved, mainly eternal life, but at the same time, not forsaking his worldly treasures and his worldly goods. He wasn't honestly seeking after God, but rather he was seeking how to get eternal life, the benefits of God, while holding on to his material possessions. So maybe I didn't answer your question. You're going, Tim, well, then honestly, how does anybody find God if nobody can seek after him. And Jesus actually gives us that answer. Move over to John chapter 15, where you see him telling his disciples, you did not choose me in verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in the father's name, he may give it to you. So here we see Jesus telling his disciples, hey, you guys didn't pick me. I picked you, and I'm also going to cause you to bear much fruit. In other words, do good works in my name, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And not only that, but all that you do, that's going to go ahead and abide. I'm going to keep you in the faith. I'm not just going to save you. I'm going to keep you saved. And then whatever you ask the Father in my name, he's going to go ahead and give it to you. Not only that, but in John chapter 6, verse 37, we see Jesus saying, All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Meaning the Father, God, is going to give people to Christ. It's not so much that we are out there actively seeking after God, but rather God is giving us to Christ. And you go, well, how did I get to Christ? Well, in that same chapter, just a few verses over in John 6, Jesus answers that question by saying, no one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws him. In other words, God is drawing us to seek out after Jesus. This isn't something that we're doing of our own volition because of our sinful nature. We're too blinded by our own sin. We'd rather have the things of the world. We'd rather have our carnal desires. But God, who sovereignly searches the heart, will draw us to Christ. And Christ, of course, as it says in that verse, 
will raise us up on that last day, meaning eternal life, a resurrected body. Furthermore, just to reiterate that, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, the natural person, this is who we all were before we were Christians, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So in other words, without the power of the Holy Spirit, without God already drawing you to Christ, without God causing you to follow Christ, you cannot understand the things of the Spirit of God because you're spiritually discerned. This falls perfectly in line with Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, where he says, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and then here's the key, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. In other words, you can't even make that confession, that profession of faith, unless the Holy Spirit is already caused you to be born again. Jesus talked about this when he was talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 when he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then goes on to say in verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born again of the Spirit. Moreover than that, we see that majority of seeker-sensitive churches, go back to what I talked about with Bill Hybels, are a senior pastor-led church. Not all of them, but a vast majority of them are a senior pastor-led church, meaning that there is typically one person who is the be-all, say-all. He is the end. He is the stopping point. It's not going to happen unless you get this person's approval, and that is a very unbiblical way to to conduct church leadership. Like I said, that is just allowing more temptations, more corruption, more sin to enter into the church, albeit potentially or actually. Hey guys, and I'm gonna go ahead and break in here real quick while I am editing this video because I don't think enough was actually said. And during this you know, few days of editing process that I'm going through on this video, I was doing more studying and more research in just how dangerous. And I think it's something that I was severely understating in this video. As I was doing more research in a lot of these churches that are considered seeker sensitive that are senior pastor led while yes some of them do have elders most of them actually do have a system of elders that senior pastor is still the number one person in control and one of the more dangerous things that i really saw out of this was something known as vision casting so i did notice when i was looking through and i was pulling up these different mission statements from churches i noticed a lot of them had instead of mission statements vision statements and this seems to be something that's consistent with a vast majority of seeker sensitive churches and mainly it is the lead pastor the founding pastor they will have a vision sometimes they will claim this vision was direct from God so almost like a prophetic vision and other times it's a vision that they feel that God has empowered them with through the Holy Spirit whatever the case may be they get this vision and that vision becomes the basis of their church united under one vision. Elevation is built on the vision God gave Pastor Stephen. We will aggressively defend our unity and that vision. Pretty much replacing the Bible, and I don't think they would use those exact words, but upon my research, that's what it really seemed like, replacing the Bible as the foundation for that church and then using that vision as the church. And if you as a church member, you as an elder, you as a deacon, whatever the case may be, if you are opposing that vision, if you give up challenges to that vision, they will not tolerate it. The visionary here is Eric. The crossing is built on the vision that God gave Pastor Eric, yeah. and we will aggressively defend that vision. Now, what does that mean, you aggressively defend that? That means that we do church the way he wants us to do it. We do church the way he wants us to do it. We do church the way he wants us to do it. And me as a campus pastor, I can't go up to Zimmerman and decide that I'm going to preach on Sunday because that's not the vision that we have for this church that God gave to Eric. Mm -hmm. And we defend that 
when people go, well, maybe we should do it this way. And we're like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. God gave Eric this vision. We do it this way because we don't want to argue with God. Because we don't want to argue with God. Just exactly how dangerous this is to have one pastor who has this vision and to question this pastor, you are questioning God himself. And you can see how these different statements that these pastors are going to make place them in an area where corruption, temptation, and sin, power, control, all these different things will just seep in and ruin that church. And as you saw from that video clip, they don't want to hear anything about your outside influences. Another reason why this leads into corruption is because you do not have anybody keeping you accountable. You can be a free reign tyrant because if somebody questions you, you can go back with the, are you questioning God? And sadly, when people do step up, when people in the church, when elders inside the church step up to that senior pastor and say, hey, what you said the other day, that wasn't really biblically aligned. It's an excuse excuse for them to throw you out. I'm not being over dramatic because it's literally been taught and said. Well, let's talk about the other end of the continuum, uh, those that are detractors, those that are fighting the vision. It, how do you deal with that yeah, side I, of the equation? There are, are still some people mm -hmm. who are at that point actual stone throwers. I mean, they're just going to dig in and make your life miserable. Uh, I have a couple of extra, even one-on-one -on -one meetings with them. And then I, my big line, you've heard me use it before. I say, all right, you, you don't agree with this vision. I'm asking you as a fellow believer, don't sin, don't sin. in your disagreement yeah. with this vision. Don't sin. Reject. Do I need to spell that out? Why, why, why? That's so cold. It's so wise. A factious man is a danger to the church, and you are released by Scripture to release him. And I'm releasing you to take a small portion of your church's budget, build a catapult, put it in the church parking lot, and load it regularly. I think we can shoot this one right out of our county. I mean, it's just a proven fact that when you have somebody that is so power hungry, so desiring control, that they're gonna, of course, kick out anybody who disagrees with them. This was a method that Mark Driscoll often used all the time, and he would brag about it. And look what happened to him and his church. His church no longer exists. Mars Hill is gone. He was kicked out as a pastor. He was disqualified by his church. And now he's out pastoring somewhere else and hopefully not taking these same ideals with him. I don't know. I don't pay attention to them, but it's just sad because at the end of the day, when you're this power hungry, all that equals is dictatorship and tyrant. Here's what I've learned. You, you cast vision for your mission, and if people don't sign up, you move on. You move on. There are people that are going to die in the wilderness, and there are people that are going to take the hill. That's just how it is. I am all about blessed subtraction. There, there is a pile of dead bodies behind the Mars Hill bus, <laughs> and by God's grace, it'll be a mountain by the time we're done. You either get on the bus or you get run over by the bus. Those are the options, but the bus ain't going to stop. And uh, I'm just a I'm just a guy who is like, look, we love you, but this is what we're doing. There's a few kind of people. There's people who get in the way of the bus. They got to get run over. There are people who want to take turns driving the bus. They got to get thrown off because <laughs> they want to go somewhere else. There are people who will uh, be on the bus, leaders and helpers and servants. They're awesome. There's also just sometimes nice people who sit on the bus and shut up. They're not helping or hurting. Just let them ride along. If you couldn't tell from that clip, it's made very, very clear the type of people that Mark Driscoll wanted at his church over in Mars Hill and the way that I'm assuming based off all these different videos that we're watching and all the studying that I'm doing that these senior pastor led churches, the people that they want are those people who are either going to number one, comply with everything they say, or the people who are just going to blindly follow, not really do anything, but they're there for numbers and they're probably giving some money. So yeah, we'll go ahead and let them stay. One of the biggest reasons why these pastors 
don't want people who are going to fight back against them is because they are going to have to change their ways. It's not going to be popular. It's going to be biblically based. And therefore, they're going to lose a lot of influence. They're going to lose a lot of money. And they're going to lose all the social media clout and whatever else that pastors are pandering for today when they are running a seeker-sensitive celebrity pastor-style church. The Bible has laid out very, very clearly that church leadership should be an elder-led thing. It should be a plurality, multiple elders who are all accountable to each other, none more powerful than each other, so that way we can avoid this corruption. If you go to Acts chapter 14, verse 23, it says, And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. All the way back in the book of Acts, in the very, very early church, they were appointing elders, plural. Titus chapter 1, verse 5 said, This is why I left you in Crete, Paul says, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Jesus obviously knew the importance of accountability. He also knew that we weren't supposed to go at this faith alone. There is only one head of the church, and that is Jesus Christ. This is why oftentimes when Jesus would send out his disciples, he would send them out in pairs. He would send them with an accountability partner, you can kind of say. And there were multiple reasons behind that, but accountability was definitely one of them. And that's the whole point of having a plurality of elders, multiple elders that are holding you as the senior pastor accountable. Because at the end of the day, if you are the senior pastor of a church that's an elder-led church, then you're just another elder. You don't have any more power than any other elder inside that church. But that type of system goes against the grain when you have a senior pastor that has a vision, and that vision supposedly comes from God. Don't sin. And you're going to get some elder who's going to tell you what to do, some guy who's just, you know, oh yeah, he's an elder, whatever. I'm the senior pastor. But elders that walk around with the capital A heavy duty, I'm here to hold you accountable account will make you accountable that's a control move all right that's a control move and it's rooted in pride and it's not the senior pastor's job I'm, I'm sorry that you're not happy with your career but it's not my job to make you feel significant by folding my full-time ministry under your 10 hour a week volunteer opportunity Okay. Obviously, that senior pastor of a seeker-sensitive megachurch has no respect or regard for elders, but probably only views them as unwanted necessity because the Bible, you know, talks about it. Oh, these little elders with their little 10 hour a week, whatever. This is what happens when you are full of pride and you think you are the one who is in control and the church belongs to you, not Jesus Christ. Christ. Another thing we have to think about is this concept of a seeker-sensitive church that wants to make things comfortable and avoid these tough topics that may cause division, avoid these tough topics that may drive some people outside the church. We have to look at the way Jesus conducted evangelism. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, he said, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. Jesus was saying that his word was going to be divisive. It was going to cause division. It was going to be father against son and daughter against mother and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law and the list can go on and on and on. Jesus was going to cause division by the very words that he was preaching. And when you even look at Jesus's life, Many people paint this picture as if Jesus was this very inclusive person, very kumbaya, when rather, when we see Jesus talking to people, he said some very difficult things. You go back to the book of John, specifically John chapter 6, where he's telling people to eat his flesh and drink his blood. This was not the calmest way to go about spreading the gospel, but yet Jesus said it anyways. And what was the result of that? Go to John chapter 6 at verse 66, and it says, As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and we're not walking with him anymore. Jesus purposely was driving out people who were not 
committed, who could not take these tough sayings, who could not take these divisive topics. We as the church should not be afraid to talk about these divisive topics today that the Bible so clearly defines out. Now, lastly, in my thoughts, my opinions, my conclusions, I want to remind everybody that the number one reason why we as Christians gather together at church is to glorify God. Church was never meant to be a place to be this giant evangelistic driving force. Church was never meant to be focused on the unbeliever, the unregenerate. Rather, church is supposed to be focused on growing the sheep. Number one, first and foremost, glorifying God. Number two, growing the sheep. And number three, empowering and equipping those sheep to go out into the world and gather more sheep. I heard this old saying before from a pastor of mine, and he said, sheep begot sheep. The church should not be the main evangelism driving force, as in the building, the place that we gather. Rather, it should be the sheep inside that church gathering and evangelizing these people. And that really lies to the heart of the matter, the main issue with the seeker-sensitive model is this. The focus is on man and not on God. It is honestly really what can you get out of God rather than what can you provide God through worship. And that's worship as in the music we sing because it often gets twisted. People always think that worship is only the music, but it's not only the music that we sing. Worship is the sermons that are preached when we're gathering together, when we're fellowshipping, and when we're learning about God. That is all wrapped up into worship. Well, honestly, it is very admirable that churches want to see more people converted. We cannot sacrifice the gospel on the altar of numbers or in other words, words, the numbers-driven church, which is so far often the seeker-sensitive church. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. While seeker-driven churches want to see people come to Christ, we need to understand that no matter what, Christ's church is going to prosper. God's church is going to be built up, and it's all through the power of God, not through the power of man. We are simply the tools that God chooses to use to make this happen, mainly through the Great Commission. I've talked to some believers before who get really discouraged, especially when it comes to this evangelism form, and they're wondering, how can I be more relevant? How can I reach them where they're at, et cetera, et cetera, and so on. We need to understand that our job isn't to evaluate when you go back to the parable of the soils. Our job isn't to cultivate the soil and to ground it up and to fertilize it and do all these other things. Our job is to spread the seeds for that soil no matter where we are at or what the soil condition may be. Because honestly, last I checked, I cannot look into the heart of a person. The only person that can do that is God. All I can do is spread that seed. And I'll use the words of the Apostle Paul when it came to this. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. In other words, we may plant, we may water seeds, but we're not the one ultimately responsible for someone's salvation. It is God who is going to give that growth. So ultimately, what is the answer on this? Honestly, it is my opinion that the seeker-sensitive church is not a biblical church. It is not a church model that we should be using. And albeit, there are some benefits that came out of this movement, like I said, and some of the pros and cons, things such as maybe dressing a little bit more casual. No, you don't have to put on your Sunday suit and your tie and all that kind of stuff, and you can still preach a good gospel message. Now, we don't want people showing up in pajamas and things like that. You know, there, there is a level of respect that we should have for God, a little bit of reverence there for him. But do we got to get dressed up in a suit and tie in our fanciest dress? No. I mean, for the most part, most people just do that for the pleasing of other people. Other things, like I mentioned, the technology, then the innovativeness that these seeker-sensitive churches have been driving forth when it comes to the internet and how they reach people, things of that nature, those are ultimately good things. But like I said, we can never compromise that and sacrifice 
the gospel, the core tenets of the faith, on the altars of convenience? The answer is we preach the full gospel. We preach the Bible, not topics. We teach the Bible, not topics. We let the Bible draw out those topics, and we focus on the church worshiping and glorifying God. And in this, we're going to see less false conversions. We're going to see less church scandals like you see in so many of these mega churches. And you're going to see more glory given to God through true worship in spirit and in truth.